I'm excited for this! Exclamation point, exclamation point. You get it. Thank you, thank you. That's greatly appreciated. I've been waiting for this series to come out for months. Thank you so much, and as always, great work, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Good job as always, Andrew. Thank you. You're welcome. Party hat. Nice. Please do a metal tutorial for everything. That is a vibe. That is a, most definitely a mood. Why not web GPU? Interesting videos, nonetheless. I get that. I'm trying to get away from the combinatorial explosion of videos. I say as I start a new series, well, no one's perfect. So welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to be looking at software rendering. Very, very basic to start with. Pretty much clearing, clearing the screen with a solid color. To start with, I guess, a few questions. Number one, why? And the answer to that is very clear, because it's fun. And also, I found myself with a lot of spare time to put this stuff together. And then, hey, did I mention that it's fun? Did you not make a series on this already? Well, you know, I sort of did, and it was pretty good, but I feel that it got a little bogged down in the implementation details. So that series was in C++, and I was throwing in things like SIMD and stuff, which were very cool, but they did detract a little bit from the, the actual concepts. So also I sort of went into that series with a, a very clear goal in mind of, I want to make a 3D renderer in software. And I basically achieved that, but this time I want to come in with a more diffuse goal of basically setting up a software rendering environment, then grabbing an old, you know, ye oldy computer graphics textbook and just going through algorithms for drawing various like circles and lines and things just for fun. Okay, what will we need? This series will be running in Python. We will need a few Python libraries, specifically PyOpenGL, SDL, sorry, not SDL, Pygame. You know what I mean. Pygame uses SDL, uh, NumPy, Number, if you like, and some other things. Where can we get the code? The code, it will be linked down below. We'll have that in the video description. Oh, and just a side note, in the previous video, I had some comment people saying that this isn't real software rendering if I use OpenGL to get a color buffer displayed on the screen. Well, newsflash, how do you think SDL gets a color buffer on the screen? In this series, I'm not going to be writing my own machine code, you know, rasterizer to get stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to be digging into the assembly code of the GPU. That's... That's not the topic, and I'm also not going to be using simple set pixel operations provided by Pygame or SDL, because they're under the hood, they're doing the same thing, but less efficiently. In the beginning, basically computers had a reserved region in memory. It was somewhere in RAM. If you write to that, that will display on the screen. And in this series, I'm going to be sort of approximating or emulating that. Here's the way the program will work. We'll have our app. And then we'll have our engine, and our engine will split into two stages. We'll have our front end, which basically intercepts any command, takes any call to do stuff. And it will also be calling on this back end. Now, the engine back end is pretty much going to be handling the job of displaying a NumPy array on the screen. It'll take a very simple instruction, just say, hey, present this to the screen, and it will do that but otherwise it will 100% stay out of our way. In addition, we're gonna have a bunch of drawing functions. Now, all these little rounded rectangles are gonna be classes, but the drawing functions will be literally just functions because I'm gonna be compiling them into machine code and that doesn't work with classes or doesn't work very well. So like I said, today's topic is pretty much to get an RGB color and put that on the screen. Now the format I'm going with is 32-bit unsigned integers. So if we look at this result right down the bottom, we can see that it has 32 bits running from bit zero up to bit 31. What I need to do is I need to pack the channels of an RGB alpha color into that integer. And the way I'm going to do that 
is I'll have a four component array of bytes. So we'll have eight bits for the red channel, green channel, and so on. And then I'm going to shift those into the appropriate positions such that when I add them together, they will be independent of each other and we'll get the result down below. Now, hopefully, as you can see, if I take the byte representing the red color and shift it up by 24 bytes, so, sorry, 24 bits, which is three bytes, then it will now be occupying the highest byte of the result. And the same thing for the green, blue, and then alpha channel will not need any shift. So at this point, I'm actually going to close things down and have a look at the code. Hopefully this is visible. I'll just quickly talk through how this works. In the code linked down below, we'll have a few files. Now, like I said, we don't need to touch this stuff. Shaders, we don't need it. Backend, we don't need it. Have a brief look at it, but we don't need it. We have this config file. This config file holds all of the common imports. We'll be using these in our other functions. The reason I need this is, for instance, the backend will actually initialize Pygame, but then the main function will need to use Pygame as well. So libraries like Pygame will need to be imported and visible to both function, uh, both modules, sorry. And I don't want to import it twice, so this is how I actually get around that. But anyway, just super briefly, we have the engine backend and the really important thing that we have for the engine is two things, basically. First up, it's the color buffer. Now think of the color buffer as a, a big array where every number in that array is a pixel on the screen. So if I write to that, that will become visible on the screen. And then we can close all this. We don't need to worry about this, but this one here, present, is important as well. So present will actually sort of flip that array and put it onto the screen. It won't, it won't flip it, but you know what I mean, like flipping the display. So the way this will work, the way I'll interface with this engine backend is at creation, the front end will initialize an instance of the backend, and then it will fetch the color buffer. And because this is a NumPy array, we only need to fetch it once. We get a reference to it and we can just work with that. But then when it comes time to draw a frame, we put in whatever logic we need and then tell the backend to present. And the backend has a reference to that same array and it puts it up on the screen. As a matter of fact, to test, we can play this right now. So again, this is the code linked down below. We can download it. Give it a run. Why does Visual Studio Code want my microphone? That's strange. Anyway, it's probably not listening to me. So here we have our array. It was given some default color. That doesn't matter. But yeah, it's working. We can close that down. What I want to do is I want to implement a function which will convert an array of bytes into an RGB color. So I'll go ahead and define this function. So there we have it. Nothing too fancy. We pretty much unpack the channels of the color and then combine them together with bit shifts and return that. So, yep, so far so good. What I'll do is I'll just go down to the draw frame function and I'll give myself a color. So I'm going to create, whoops.
cool. So hopefully you can see we construct a NumPy array with the following RGBA channels. And the really important part is, is that we specify the data type is unsigned 8-bit integers, in other words, bytes. Okay, cool. So now what we need to do is set a color. As a matter of fact, set all of the colors. We can see in this diagram that we have, let's say, an array, and the entry in that array we want to replace. The terminology here is that X will play the role of the destination fragment or destination color, and Y will play the role of the source. We want to take the source and copy it over on top of the destination. So the first thing I need to do is clear off the value of X. As we can see, if we take the bitwise AND of any value with zero, it comes out to zero. And then we can see that if we take the bitwise OR with any value, it changes to that value. So what we'll do is first up, take the color buffer, do a bitwise AND with zero, that clears everything, and then bitwise OR with the incoming color. And that will flush over the color really, really quickly. So let's do that. Okay, so here I've just gone through those operations, and now I will go ahead and apply them. So what we'll do is we'll yep, clear the screen, we'll apply our color buffer, and we'll flush that out with the clear color, I said, the clear color that we defined above. Cool. So I'll give, give this a go. Why can I not speak today? And as we can see, the color that we defined has been put over and yeah, the frame rate's going pretty well. So just to make sure this isn't a fluke, I'll just talk through it. If I put in a color which is completely red, yep, that's what we get. Pretty, pretty hard on the eyes, isn't it? Um, and you know, I wonder if this works. I think this works. I think I didn't, yeah, that's right. I didn't enable alpha blending because it's a bit of a nuisance. So we can actually put the alpha at zero. That works just fine. But I like to leave it in there anyway, just for readability. There we go. We've got full green and nothing else. Similarly, hard on the eyes. And now let's put in full blue. Excellent. Did that wake you up? Okay, because <laughs> it's, a, it's a harsh color. It's a very harsh color. But anyway, so we've got that. Those are our two functions that we did today. So we're almost done, but there's maybe one more thing that I want to talk about. And that is what I was talking about before about compiling code. So this will not make a big difference at the moment, but I'm just going to put this in because you can take a function and apply a decorator, which will then compile that code. And the rub with that is that if you have compiled code that calls other code, every bit of those functions, every stage of that code needs to be compiled. And so even though this won't affect performance at the moment, if I were later on to put in some compiled code that wanted to convert a color or something, I would need this in there. Anyway, so as we can see, we've got a few variants of the NGIT decorator. The first one is fully naive. It, um, yeah, just compiles. But what it does is every time the function is called, the library will look at that, that invocation and say, all right, what are the data types of the arguments? And then it will, if the function call is done many times with different arguments, there'll be different versions of that compiled. And dynamically, at runtime, one of those versions will be selected which does impose some, some performance overhead. Um, but the more explicit type is we have ngit and then we specify which data type we expect to return and which data types we expect to take in. And in this case, number pretty much sticks to that definition. It reduces the number of runtime checks. And if we put in the wrong thing, it will give us an error. 
So let's go ahead and decorate our code in the explicit form. If we go over to the config, we can see that we've imported ngit, the decorator, but I've also gone ahead and imported these data types, uint32 and uint8. Actually, I was a little tricky, and you'll see that in here I started casting these things to the appropriate data type. And the reason for that is that number will complain severely if that is not in there. So let's start with map to uint32. So I put in ngit. My expected return type is a uint32. And I've got one argument, which will be an array of uint eights. Now this is a tuple, so even though you know, when there's one element, we need to put a comma there. So let's give that a go. And what I'm checking for is that we don't get any errors. Nice, we don't get any errors. Just that weird thing about secure coding. I don't know, huh, what's that about? But anyway, and then we'll go ahead here. So we'll say, decorate this. My expected return type is none, so I'll just empty it, uh, open a tuple and start putting in my arguments. My color buffer will be an array of uint32 elements, and my color will be a uint32. But that's it. There we go, and this works. And we can verify that it works by breaking it. So let's say, for instance, that I just want to clear this off with the integer zero. There we go, and we get an error. And it says, hey, um, we are trying to perform this I and integer and operation, and we're getting an array of uint 32s and a 64 bit integer. And the compiler says, hey, um, we got these types. That's not going to work. That's not going to work at all. Here are the possible types that we can put in. But as you can see, like none of this matches. So what I'm going to do instead, as I was saying, is I will explicitly cast this to a 32-bit zero. Bit strange, but um, this is sort of an esoteric topic anyway. And there we go. It works. Nice. Again, not such a big deal right now, but when we're doing more computational numeric stuff, it will make a big difference. And that is it. Congratulations. A winner is you. Yeah, this was fun. I hope you had fun and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.